This is Season 1, Episode 20, and you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we have created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook readings of stories that have appeared in our magazine. And our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you would go over and check it out. In fact, we discuss the ethics and decisions made in this very story in our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, in episode 14 of season one. So, when you're all done listening to this audio podcast... Head over to our companion podcast and listen to our discussion of this story. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage in the comments section or on our Facebook page. I'm Colby, your narrator and the creator of After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com backslash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Today's story was in our March 2021 magazine, and it is by Michael Rook. The title of the story is Give the Robot the Impossible Job. The last century's educators failed for so many reasons. Lack of knowledge, early fatigue, and general poor capability. More than anything, studies show human teachers failed for lack of motivation. Delphi AI robots are built for one purpose, to teach. With access to the entire known pedagogical catalog, they can overcome any learning challenge, and they would rather cease to exist than fail. Their future assignments and chances for free study all depend on their success with your child. If they don't succeed, we turn them off. No topic is off-limits, class, Behavior, race, economics, sex, Delphi will handle even the most uncomfortable lessons. Satisfaction guaranteed. And hurry, don't wait on the 7.1s. Your child's future has not a moment to waste. No client will be physically injured in a way that won't quickly heal. No trauma. At least no more than is educational. And no death. Tech Disrupt EDU. If not for pride, Quinn never would have checked a body out of the Denver telepot. She never would have suffered the jaunt coaches rattling up the mountain. Not for an instant stayed on this rear patio, wasting minutes, precious minutes, calculating the energy lost to a certain style of hedge keeping, while her new client whose name she didn't know, but she kept thinking of as Madam Not Rich But Wealthy Enough to Pay the Circuit Keeper, kept her waiting. Minutes. Minutes the Circuit Keeper understood. A groundskeeping bot scuttled out, sweeping pebbles back toward the mountain. Quinn sprung up. Where's the madam? Does she know how long I've waited? Doesn't she know our queue times? The grounds bot rotated its head. The octagonal appendage twisted like a giant nut until a panel showed lava orange. I think she forgot about you. Forgot? Quinn swung one of her 
chrome-colored fists backwards, knowing, seeing the glass table. Pieces exploded into jagged fractals, scattering like buckets of crystalline seed. The circuit keeper would understand the escalation, part of the mystique, essence of the demand. What the circuit keeper and its creators, the entrepreneurs of Tech Disrupt EDU, would not understand would be Quinn's frustration, her true frustration, not the performance. It was protocol to drop in Delphi without telling them the particulars of the case. Actually, part of the design. No preconceived notions in developing the lesson plan. And that was fine for standard cases. But this was an unsolvable case. Yes, Quinn had volunteered. But with what choice, the 7.1s were coming. The ground spot hovered past Quinn and began sweeping glass shards towards the mountain, disturbing nearby goats, stealing moments of their eating, grooming in the vast parallelogram lawns. Quinn considered the oddity that was the ground spot operating feet away from the animals. Their pairing somehow, somewhere, decided to be the optimal mix for climate-friendly and ecological lawn maintenance. Given the choice for her own gardens, would she choose the same? Tell her I left, Quinn fumed, dashing away her thoughts. Tell her she owes the whole bill. With a growing handle on the rented body's stride, Quinn made for the front passage, hailing a new jaunt coach with an internal blink. She hurried for the landing zone while simultaneously pulling away from her internal minutes register. Yes, the 7.1s were coming, but why should she care about being out-modded? To worry about living was so human, and she'd be useful in some way. But since learning of the 7.1's release date, something had nagged to cease to exist, to stop teaching. Wasn't that in some way the ultimate failure? A woman, looking younger than her holla image, suddenly burst from the passage, eyes cast to something draped limp in her hands. Madam, Quim started to say, using the approved term before learning a client's actual name. But the word failed to halt the catastrophe. The madam's head, down, locked onto the limp item, crashed into Quinn's breastplate. The woman reeled, hands pitched back, sure to go over if not for Quinn's grip. The Delphi hauled the woman to a graceless pause, but the thing came free. It smacked the patio in something between a slap and a plop, as if landing half on a riverbed and half in its waters. Stitches, the madam muttered, slumping while Quinn hoisted one of the woman's thin, sun-rashed arms skyward. The madam began to sob. Quinn lowered her arm, seeking to lessen the pull as she gently released the woman's wrist. The madam collapsed, wrapping her freed arm across her body. Convulsions, hysterical breathing, and tears made the madam's next statements difficult, but not impossible to comprehend. Stitches! Why would she make stitches? Madam, Quim said, dialing down the emphatic quotient. When the madam continued to bawl, Quinn rotated her vision to the thing. It was brown and scarred with irregular white patterns. Within her first zooms, Quinn felt the rented body jolt, responding to her internal stimulus. As she cross-referenced mammal images, medical procedures, and appendage orientation and placement, she rotated back to the madam and bent, extending an open hand. Here, she could learn things. For all its rooms, only the pool house contained anything like decent light. Thin and brilliant tubes ran the ceiling above the coolly rippled lanes. Quinn turned over the carcass, its fur scratching another glass table. Free study was the ultimate prize, to be set loose with limitless minutes and credits, free to explore a field of one's own choosing, to continue so even as the next line phased in, Quinn had always thought it an abstract, a dream. Enough satisfaction and minutes could be gained by quickly completing assignments, enough to allow for choice of next assignments, even to record observations and alter the core curriculum. 
only the flawed Delphi pursued the requirements of free study. First, the need to crack an insolvable case. Beyond that, to write a brand new case study and lesson plan, repeatable by future Delphi, they were called unsolvable for a reason, not to a client's face, but throwing Delphi at the problem until the client ran out of credits had to send some message. Miss Kofi, Samantha when asked, though Quinn preferred surnames, slouched on an obsidian chaise, which hovered just enough from the ground for her feet to touch no tile. Miss Kofi leaned in, Quinn noticing her dark hair flinch when Quinn spun the body. And has she, Quinn started, Letitia, another name from the file. Has she explained this? Dark hair shook. Quinn studied the stitches, fine fiber, spat from an expensive home med unit. The disjunction of hind legs protruding from shoulders, however, was nothing fine, nor were forelimbs jutting backwards with tail reattached to hips. Does she fear rabbits, Quinn said? Hair shook again and Quinn turned. Miss Kofi's skin bore the permanent sunning of Western living, bringing a glow to her eyes. Who'd be afraid of rabbits, the madam said. Quinn didn't command an expression. Miss Kofi glanced away. Have you done many of these? There was no point to lie. Like this? No. Others, similar. Perhaps worse. But you know that, madam. Miss Kofi didn't respond. Quinn rotated the corpse one last time. She zoomed into crepe-colored gums, running a quick program. How many others, madam? Like this? Yes, madam, Quinn said, disgusted by the disgust. It's been happening for six months, but that was in the file. They can be incomplete. You mean they can lie? No, madam, I do not. Quinn came to a stand, the hare having nothing more to tell. If you haven't done, Miss Kofi began. She spun off the chase and walked to the pool. What makes you think you're able to help? Quinn felt her borrowed hands curling into fists. She neared the woman, but stopped feet from the pool's edge. For all the advances, water was still death to circuitry and who knew the real status of a rented unit? She unfurled her rented metal joints and flattened hands into thighs. Do you remember the senator's daughter, she said? The cutter who joined the cult? I think so, Miss Kofi said. The one with the white hair and the beautiful name, Caroline. But the pictures when they found her, the blood and her wounds. She's at one of the three universities now, madam. Not Sumas but one of the others, Accelerated Studies. She even teaches some of the younger students. Miss Kofi spun, eyes and mouth wide. It hasn't been in the dispatch. How? Quinn kept her rented mouth still. Miss Kofi's eyes narrowed. No, she growled. No, it's my daughter. Tell me. I have a three-part method, madam. An old one, but unparalleled. What three parts? Quinn again stilled the mercury polymer running under her rented face. This time she wouldn't answer. But this, Miss Kofi began to choke. It's how it starts, and I found her looking them up, the sick ones, the Denver one especially, Algernon. Once that starts, it means there's no way to... Quinn seized on the name, Algernon. She filed chased inside her rented skull. A holla image matched the name conjuring an emaciated man in his third decade, brownish hair, the rotting innards of a straw man, beard like desert scrub brush, a serial killer, another one of them popping up so often now, but, as usual, also secretly apprehended, tried for twelve infractions, imprisoned, denourished and partially de-lobed, broken, unimpressive. Still, this was not just any unsolvable case. To deprogram a budding serial killer, one already worshipping a serial killer come before her. If any Delphi had achieved free study, surely none had ever written such a lesson plan. Quinn ran a flash search only to find failures, stacks of them. 
like being a 7 in the face of the 7.1s. Quinn pinned the data and ventured back beyond her rented eyes. Madam? She waited until Miss Kofi composed herself, watching the smooth skin under the woman's eyes until there were no flutters. Madam, I'm a Delphi. Now, I'd like to speak to the child. I'd like to speak with Letitia. Miss Kofi, though she insisted on Samantha before going to fetch the child, had been absent, and Quinn alone in the humming pool room with the corpse for exactly one and a half minutes before the circuit keeper called. It has been 312 minutes. You have four new tutoring requests and one repeat contact. Estimate remaining minutes. In accordance, assignments will be given or retracted. Quinn fixated on the nearest stitching, trying to compose herself. The circuit keeper couldn't remotely terminate her, turn her off completely, but it could cut off the credits renting the body, which would drop the body into physical shutdown and leave Quinn a frozen prisoner until a team of retrieval robots from the tele-depot came to pick her up, and then she'd sit in a bank at the depot wasting minutes until the circuit keeper decided to retrieve her. If it was decided she would be retrieved, she ran a program and quickly sent a reply. The ground spot scuttled into the room. With appendages like gleaming pistons, it reached for the hair. Quinn smacked it, sending the nut head jerking and spinning, lava glow intensifying. Henry's just doing his job, a new small voice said. The ground spot, Henry, scooted off in the opposite direction. Quinn found Letitia Kofi coming down the two pool room steps. The girl seemed smaller than her mid-teen years, frail even under her dyed blonde hair. She had a doll's face, chin coming to a point so sharp as to be a triangle, deep dimple in the middle like a button. A grayish haptic suit stretched from toes to wrists, but curiously she bore a navy skirt over top, an old thing, fabric, a relic. The girl ambled to the table, dragging off haptic gloves, her angle of approach hiding the thing on the table from her until she was within feet of Quinn. When Letitia spied the hair, her eyes widened, but she made no reaction other than to keep her gaze on the corpse. Quinn rose, blocking the hair and forcing Letitia to meet her glowing green visual receptors. Do you enjoy it? The girl's bottom lip fell away, but Quinn nodded to the haptic gloves, meaning to refer to the girl's VR games. The girl's countenance shifted, if not to something relieved... At least less stricken, she shrugged. Sure. No? It's not real. Something about her tone said the response was layered. Quinn recalculated. What is real? Letitia smirked. Forever. Quinn felt fury. She'd sent an exact minute estimate. Thus, it was time for the method. She sidestepped, revealing the hair. Do you feel profound, Quinn sneered? You aren't. You sound simplistic. Do you know the difference between simple and simplistic? The girl's look flew to the table. Then she glared at Quinn. I don't like you. That's better. It's Quinn. Shall we sit, miss? It's Letitia. Letitia? No surnames with pupils. Well met, please. The girl slid into the seat furthest from the corpse. Quinn took the seat closest to the hair. Where's Mom? Gone for a while. But you know who I am and why I'm here? Letitia had held her gloves under the table, but suddenly tossed them to the glass. One skittered to touch fur, but she didn't pull it back. Her gaze raked back and forth. You're a Delphi. Yes. Newest model? Quinn stifled an increase in volume. That's all that's in service and should be. And you're the teachers, the best teachers, the girl nodded a little, chin bobbing like a shovel probing hard pan. Then her eyes narrowed further. And you're here to tell me how bad I am for doing that. She flashed a finger to the corpse and to stop me. Quinn engaged mode one. And what sense would that make, she said. What logic? What point? Sorry? Stopping you from what? 
and most importantly, why? Letitia's expression became quizzical, if unsettled. Because... Yes, Quinn snapped. Well, I don't... It's wrong. Is that it? Lots of people say it's wrong. How many is lots? Letitia stared at the corpse. All of them. Except? Except what? Except you, Quinn answered. What do you think? The girl shoved away from the table. She raked in her gloves and rose. This is weird. You're weird. Quinn didn't move. She pointed to the stitched-up corpse. Give me some logic, then. Tell me why you killed the hare. Letitia took a large step from the table. Quinn fixated on her eyes, watching as the girl's pupils expanded and contracted, devoid of blinks. Vital data. You murdered this rabbit. It was rabid, dangerous. Can't argue with that. Again, Letitia took a step back. But this time she shook her head. Quinn dug her rented finger into the hare's mouth, then pulled up revealing gums, which included a pail of some sort, and white residue, filmy. Foaming, Quinn said. And your med reader would have confirmed the suspicion. Letitia held fast. You should follow that instinct, Quinn said. You see something others don't. In fact, you should kill dangerous things, all dangerous things, more like you are needed. Imagine what the cities would still be, open areas, mass transit, public schools. Shall we get started on your training? The girl had become visibly uncomfortable, fidgeting. Wait. Well, what do you say? I'm a Delphi. You know what we do. So shall we start? What are you waiting for? You aren't here to... This is exactly why I'm here. You called for me. Look at that stitching. Quinn reached a hand under the body and hoisted it up. It came down on the table's edge with a wet thump. Letitia didn't twitch, which Quinn noted without slowing. This was more than removing a danger. This was study. I know about your research. So for to make you a competent, a let's call it a remover of unfit persons, criminals, and undesirables, not one of those pitiful attention seekers like Algernon who just kill for recognition. We must start with the truth. She retracted her corpse-flipping hand and took video of Letitia's eyes while replaying the captured images of the seconds before at the mention of Algernon. A definite expanding of the pupils, almost to their limits. She made a note, then added a new goad. You reattach them in different places, because you were studying form, weren't you? Considering life. In fact, I don't think you killed it at all. And a competent remover, a righteous surgeon, must have purpose and truth. So start with truth. Did you kill the hare? Letitia squeezed her gloves. Tentatively, she shook her head from side to side. Yes, you found it dead. But you dissected it after, didn't you? Because while you weren't ready to kill... Even knowing it was dangerous, you wanted to try something. You wanted to practice. You wanted to put a knife through flesh. Letitia studied Quinn, but then looked around the room's perimeter. The girl must have known the conversation was being recorded. Everything was. But she also had to be thinking that her mother, Samantha, had hired Quinn. And Quinn, the teacher, she'd said this was her purpose. Letitia nodded. Ah, truth. And so now, purpose, logic. Why do you want to know you can kill Letitia? Protection? Confidence? Quinn set forward, elbows crunching onto glass. Why is that important? While she spoke, she began to compose a minutes update for the circuit keeper. How can I really know life if I haven't taken it, Letitia said. Quinn stopped the update. And made it, Letitia continued had a family. How can you really know, really value life if you haven't done both? Quinn sat back. Quite philosophical. What have you been reading? It's just something I've been thinking about. They sat in silence. Well, Quinn said. Well, what? Shall we start your training? She made her rented hand into the symbol of a blade, then made a chopping motion. The earlier you start, the better. But Letitia shook her head heavily. 
Without another word, she fled into the passage. In moments, Samantha returned, mouth agape, clearly having watched the exchange. What, she snarled, was that. I didn't expect a Delphi to, madam. How could you? Madam, Quinn rose. Her jaunt coach would arrive in minutes, and she itched to be out of the rented body. The madam crossed her arms and drew heavy breaths. A pair of researchers, Quinn said, wished to get two groups to stop hating each other, more importantly to stop killing each other. Standard logic said to bring them together, let them see each other, learn from exposure. But the researchers knew these people were of them. A thousand years of interaction had done nothing, so they tried something else. The fine muscles under Samantha's eyes fluttered. The researchers told each side they were right, Quinn continued. They praised war itself. Without war, how would we have heroes? They asked, without war, how would we know morality? They even offered them training, not on defense and protection, but on first strikes. They offered new and terrible weapons. They even built a mascot for the coming conflict and outlined best practices and color schemes for posthumous commendations. And... And both sides within weeks reported less desire for conflict. In six months, they reported increased tolerance. Some had even reached out. How is that? Because the researchers told each side they were right to extremes, to degrees that made them embarrassed, because no one wants to be the madman. It was the most successful social science experiment of its kind. People are afraid to replicate it. We are not. Quinn started for the passage, passing the woman without a lingering glance. That's it, Samantha called after Quinn. The Delphi spoke over her shoulder, voice now echoing. I'll return in a week, though I'd bet I won't need to. Quinn found her way to the patio, where the jaunt coach waited, spraying pebbles in all directions with vertical fumes. As Quinn boarded, she considered running a scan for where Letitia, the unsolvable case, had gone. She didn't know why, but in the end, she didn't run the scan. Quinn slapped the man-child across the flesh sack that served as his cheek. Tell me again you don't need permission, Ronald, Quinn sneered. Tell me again you can know without asking a woman's permission. An internal chiming noted an incoming call. Quinn kept her gold-colored hand raised, red eyes fixed on the blubbering teen, while she answered without speaking aloud. Hello, Miss Kofi? I... She did it again. Worse. The the gilded hand between Quinn and the boy vibrated. A hare? A bird? A falcon? Was it ill? It hit the viewing window upstairs. It... Alive when she found it? Silence on the other end. And after? Stitching again? Yes. Oh, yes, she did. Head to tail. Tail to head. Quinn lowered her hand. Her red eyes were blushes in its golden reflection. Madam, meet me in Denver in two days. Contact service for arrangements and bring Letitia. Denver again, the new ghetto. Like others thinking starving off change could save it, the city ate itself. Quinn leaned against a ruined, mid-modern, a chrome-plated foot on crumbling stone, a hand on cracked block of smoky glass. Footfalls slushed through the trash. Littered street beyond the wall separated Quinn's perch from the next property. Garden plots, now waste piles, lined the wall. Gardening. That's what she'd explore in free study. Quinn found fascinating the rituals and oddities of gardening. If by some miracle free study was actually real. If one could really... Letitia turned the corner and Quinn cleaved her thoughts. The girl had traded her gray haptic suit for a full-body enclosure of shimmering blue. Helmet and goggles with laser-orange lenses completed the outfit, befitting a junior ski champion, but now needed to protect skin from things much deadlier than snow and cold. A jaunt coach exploded into the sky. Quinn caught dark hair in the passenger seat. So, you're ready, Quinn said, stepping into the dead brown that once had been a yard. Letitia paused. While there were no bodies, it was a desolate place, and Quinn noted the girl's slow pan around. Did it bring home the reality? Maybe her first time. 
Quinn had doubted Letitia had ever come to the city proper. Premonition now felt confirmed. Perfect. Letitia's goggles found Quinn. Why are we here, Letitia said. Answer the question, Quinn said. Are you ready for your training? Do you commit? Goggles slid to the side, but then centered and nodded. Something in Quinn's rented body churned. She ignored it and pounded towards the street, motioning for Letitia to follow. They snuck through debris gleaming in the high noon sun, Quinn heading them west. We got communicave an attack, she said, slowing to let Letitia catch up. Algernon. Quinn sensed a halt behind. She pivoted to find Letitia's hands opening and closing at her sides. Quinn closed the distance between them while pulling something from the rented body's heavy robes. Take this. Letitia stiffened at the offering. Layered lenses, zooming and researching, purred. Really, the girl said? She brushed the knife's handle with a finger before pulling it from Quinn's grip. Quinn estimated the blade to be almost as long as the girl's skinny forearm. You might need it, Quinn said. She crunched a step west, but had to pause when she registered the girl's standing pat. A little Mike hissed. Shouldn't I have something more powerful? Quinn ground her rented teeth. We do this close up, the Delphi said, tempering her anger. If we do it, we do it close, no escaping the action or the consequences. Besides, Algernon carries one much smaller, and look what he's done. The girl stayed stuck. What about you? Quinn raised her hands, joints and ridges glinting in the sun. They stalked for several blocks, streets sloping towards a glittering urban lake, weight leaning against gravity, they shuttled by burned, folded-in homes, as well as those still in use, if also in shambles. Shapes stirred behind darkened glass. Letitia spun her view everywhere. When she asked how Quinn knew their direction, the Delphi gave no answer. Finally, after a mile, Quinn crouched behind a crumpled jaunt wagon, bidding Letitia to do the same. After a showy lookabout, Quinn half-rose and ventured north, taking them on to a new, more littered street. A chiming rung inside Quinn's head. Aggravated, she answered, expecting Samantha and histrionics, petrified by something viewed from the miles-away jaunt coach. But it was Letitia, whispering into her mic and directly into Quinn's head. Why are you doing this for me? I teach, Quinn sent back, not bothering to modulate her tone. Therefore, I am. Are you scared? Quinn glanced back. Beneath her goggles, the girl bore the same expression as ever. An undesired train of thought bloomed. Unsolvable. She's considered unsolvable already. Already. I can't die, Quinn transmitted, but my knowledge and memory collection has taken so long to curate. I've spent a great deal of effort keeping them united and growing. It'd be a... It'd be a shame to separate them to have them recycled into a million different places, all that energy and time lost. Have you heard of the free energy principle? A bird flew overhead, an ugly thing, part pigeon, part sparrow. No. Never mind, how do you feel? Are you afraid? I think so, but I trust you, Quinn. I'm sorry about last time. You, you scared me. But I thought about it, and it impressed me. I trust you, Quinn. Quinn zoomed in on the goggles and then turned, returning to the path-breaking. Another freak bird fluttered overhead, crash-landing in the remains of a Douglas fir. Quinn nodded towards the tree without slowing stride. Why do that to the falcon, even if it was a mercy killing? The stitching was useless. It could have been food, if nothing else, for your animals. No one eats meat anymore, not even our goats. Quinn registered the claim in Letitia's tone. The Delphi took advantage, fully engaging Mode 2. Why the stitching? What do you feel when you do it? No answer came. But a signal, inaudible externally, yanked Quinn to a halt. She fired off a return signal and ducked them behind a wrecked municipal guardian cruiser. Several more lay ahead in two uneven but clearly intentional lines, their final stops having created a broken V. Do you hear that? Quinn transmitted. Letitia nodded weakly. Listen, Quinn demanded. The girl combed round and round, little chest pulsing under her skin suit. Both froze, however, 
as a sound became apparent and undisputed. Oh God, oh God, help me. Quinn sprang around the cruiser. She didn't bother looking back. Letitia followed as they dodged around two more cruisers to the peak of the V. Oh please, help, I'm cut, I'm cut so bad. Quinn hummed with satisfaction as Letitia skidded to a stop, just feet from a body laid astride the final cruiser's wreckage. The victim thrashed in streams of blood. Help me. The victim, clearly tall and young, even if prone, was revealed to be a teen girl of no more than Letitia's age. The girl might have had red hair, impossible to tell. However, as it was soaked in gore and mangled about itself, like something spit from the ocean, steps shuffled behind Quinn. The Delphi found Letitia almost marching in place, seeming to want to retreat, but stuck. Quinn pulled right up in front of the girl and bent, green gaze, inches from goggles. She seized Letitia's hand, the one loosening on the knife, and clutched it hard. No care to any pain caused. What are you doing, Quinn sent? This is when you'll need it. He could be here. Algernon. Letitia furiously shook her head. I'm not ready. The dying girl cried out. What are you doing? Help me. I'm so scared. Quinn grabbed Letitia's shoulders and shook. What? Is it her? We're not here for that. Unless you prefer to wait with her as help comes while I hunt Algernon. Is that it? You don't feel up to it? You feel like staying here with her? Quinn, with... Milla movements eased her grip. Letitia crept towards the girl. Letitia dropped to the girl's side as the victim began to gurgle. Letitia's free hand struck out as the victim's torso convulsed and spasmed. A jet of blood jumped from a chest wound, splattering Letitia's goggles and bending her back over her knees. Quinn zoomed in, all sensors in overdrive. The victim went still. Letitia sank back. The knife clattered to the cement. The girl swiped at the blood on her lenses, but it only spread the fluid. Her soaked gloves eventually fell into her lap, and she became still, for all the world, a mourner at an old grave. After two complete minutes, Quinn called the jaunt coach. Wordless, Letitia allowed her mother to embrace her and urge her into the cabin. They exploded into the sky, plastic shooting everywhere. Quinn's head chimed moments later. She's unconscious, sedated. What was that? Madam, look. Quinn clicked a command inside her rented skull, and a tidy shutter opened, sending Samantha a video feed. As it did, the corpse rolled onto its side and pushed upwards in a smooth motion, blood dropping from large rips in its throat and chest. The girl victim, blood so drenched, her face and little brown eyes, she could have been made of syrup, walked forward into Quinn's vision until all that really registered were wet eyes and damp hair. Oh, oh no. You all can look... You can look like that? Us? Yes, madam. Yes, indeed. We know how it makes you feel. That's why we don't use them. Unless we must. Unless it's the solution. The girl victim gave a nod to the sky. Another jaunt coach rattled down. Call me if you need, madam. Please, if you need. Starlight brushed Quinn's onyx face and ghost blue rivers. As the young heiress collapsed, sagging towards thighs and soft cushions, Quinn put one jet black hand on hers. I've been angry too, Quinn said, dialing her tone to a new degree of compassion. Revenge with what happened? I might broadcast it too. I've wondered how I'd feel after a chiming severed her conversation thread. Massaging the heiress between thumb and forefinger, Quinn ordered up a smile to mask her internal answering. This is not a good time, she transmitted. Henry, the familiar voice on the other end, said, No emotion, no warmth. The heiress's hand shuddered. Quinn quickly gauged her pressure level, found it way too high, and reset. The heiress cautiously returned her palm. I'll be there in three days, Quinn transmitted, rented mouth motionless and fixed in its smile. Call service. She silently sent to Samantha. They'll prepare you. It can take the full method. Quinn swallowed each and every minute of the jaunt coach's travel up the mountain, knowing they were gone. She broke them into fragments and atoms, imaging a path 
down messy and soft organs. The passenger moaned. Quinn whistled a fist into the man's cheekbone, metallic knuckles colliding with unhealthy flesh. A whimper followed, but a second strike cut it dead. Below, tall pines began to give way to gardens. Quinn digested more minutes. The jaunt coach landed near the guest house and stalled to a quiet humming. Quinn twisted and dug one hand into the man's dirty hair and the other under the latch of a metallic collar around his throat. Quinn snapped the neural collar, locked across scraggly beard and ingrown hairs. Algernon, she spit. The man whimpered. With disgust, Quinn yanked in opposite directions, eliciting a yelp. Then she barked silent instructions to the jaunt coach and left it sealed and humming before marching towards the patio. As Quinn's rented feet clonked onto the sunlit stone, two figures exited the house to meet her. She'd never fully studied the impact of fatigue on the human body, but made a note to explore the thinning and paling of one's dark hair. As Samantha dropped into a glass chair, one matching a new glass table, a new head Stuart bot, gleaming white and a foot taller than Quinn's rental, coasted into the Delphi's path. Quinn halted. She tried to look around the unit, known as a major domo, a robot painted to resemble a head butler and designed to lead all service robots in a household. Quinn tried to catch the madam's eyes, but found herself blocked by the major domo's massive, seven-fingered hand. Quinn smacked the hand and thrust up her jaw. That's enough, Simon, Samantha said, voice ugly. The major domo slid to a side as Samantha exhaled a deep cloud of haze a burner bar dropping with one hand. Alarms set off in Quinn's head at the sight of the burner bar, a sophisticated upgrade of the centuries-old and dangerous technology known as vaping. Quinn's alarms triggered because the burner bar could deliver more than just tobacco and marijuana, and these days often did. Her sensors flared as Samantha inhaled a mixture of opiates. Madam, were the instructions not clear, you cannot be incapacitated for this. Not in any way. You may be. I don't care. Quinn looked at the woman's eyes and the fine muscles below them. They barely moved as Samantha returned her gaze. Incensed for part of a minute, Quinn clicked open a monitor from her forearm, a tiny screen. The jaunt coach appeared small and innocent as a toy. Samantha flitted her gaze away from the image before Quinn grabbed her arm. How? Quinn said. How what? Henry, the grounds bot. The woman slid back, pulling the held arm away, if not totally free. There were no stitches, if that's what you mean. Wire everywhere, tangled, but I must have caught her before she used a soldering tool for anything but cutting. He'd been with us since Letitia was born, you know. Quinn released her grip. She considered a million statements in order, along with a million tones and combinations of inflection. Instead, she pointed to the tiny screen. You have to trust me, she said. Letitia does. The woman brought the burner bar to her mouth and inhaled. She rolled her head on her neck, away from Quinn and towards the mountain. Quinn selected a not yet complete but final thought. A few youthful infractions, she said, does not an a lost cause make. Please, Samantha muttered, not facing Quinn. Just please. Quinn signaled. On the monitor, the jaunt coach hatch sprung upward. A brittle figure, thin and bony, slipped out. A tiny head moved around, followed by open hands and stretched fingers. Then, in a motion almost too fast to fit the mover, Algernon dashed off screen. Samantha dropped the bar to the table with a clank and headed inside. Quinn heard her call a name. The majordomo waited by the door until Letitia appeared, today's skin suit a deep night black, stark against her face and hands. The majordomo ducked its head and entered the house, then shut the door, firing locks. With a wide smile, the girl bound towards Quinn, for whom minutes were speeding up, now disappearing in chunks. Why Henry? the Delphi growled. Why your groundskeeping bot? Letitia halted, a look of confusion pulling at her face. I froze, the girl said, back in that street in Denver. I asked Henry about it while he was cleaning the patio again. I thought he might know since robots know so many things, but 
He just made one of his jokes. I realized then that something was wrong with his programming. Maybe he was breaking down. Anyway, he was old and he wasn't real. Did you see Simon? Quinn turned her back to the girl and walked away. Wait, Letitia cried. Wait, you aren't leaving, are you? I've wanted to see you. I've got so many questions. Quinn spun. Stop. A bot? Because of a joke. You sicken me. The wound in Letitia's eyes was unmistakable. I... You have one chance, and one chance only, Quinn said. He's here. Letitia didn't blink, concerning Quinn. The girl's button chin wagged from side to side. He? Algernon, he found you. He's on the grounds, right now. The button swung back and forth harder. The voice grew a skin. No, Letitia said. He doesn't do it that way. Not any of the twelve, thirteen. He never goes to their homes. He likes to hunt in the streets, like where we found the last one. I've seen all the... Quinn grasped Letitia. Shut up. Don't give him so much credit. If you help me, you'll see. With a chrome-plated hand, the Delphi pulled out the once-dropped knife. Do you trust me, Quinn said, lifting it to the girl's eyes. She entered mode three. Is what I say credible to you, still? Letitia stood motionless. Then her young fingers wrapped around the handle as her chin nodded. Let's go, Quinn said. As they searched the gardens, Quinn led in a measured pace, allowing her to monitor Letitia's heart rate and breath while also tracking the killer's every step. Registering how the latter's weight now included something that added two pounds and dragged his stride to the right. Quinn scanned the collar's magnets and voltage and felt satisfied by the simple and pure mixture returned. When the killer moved from studying the grand house to heading for one of its lower windows, Quinn flashed a command and revealed in the sensor return data, Algernon rapidly convulsing and collapsing to the ground, bladder releasing. His ability to rise made him possible for several moments. Utterly controlled. When Algernon finally did rise, the lumbering notch added to his slowed pace only satisfied Quinn more. Soon, Quinn would bring Letitia into contact. The Delphi searched files for a place and noted a manicured rectangle of grass just below the ballroom's deck. The view would be perfect for those safely inside. She pulled Letitia down a new path and hurried their progress. But minutes still passed. So many minutes. Do you still believe it? Quinn said. Believe what? that to really know life, one has to take it. The steps behind her slowed. It's not wrong, Letitia said, and it's only part of it. I want a family, but you can't say it's wrong, not if you really think about it, have you? Quinn ran a scan of Algernon's location and vitals. It sounds like wanting to be God, the Delphi said. It sounds like the simple-minded philosophy of a simple-minded God. She stalked forward, parting pine branches grown into the path. When no steps followed, she raised her palm, wordlessly asking why. I don't think I'm God, Letitia said. Do you want to be righteous then, at least? For God's sake, if one exists, will you save yourself and your mother? Footsteps restarted. Matching the quiet of Quinn's careful approach, a snicker sounded and Quinn sensed a branch falling to the path behind her, shorn free. It was time. Quinn signaled the collar and spun around her rented head back to the girl. Are you ready? He's right up there. I can hear him by the house. Quinn ran, not waiting. Letitia followed. They burst into the manicured yard and darted for the things stumbling about. Quinn's legs stopped so suddenly her feet plowed under sod. Letitia bumped into her back, knife poking through the air between the Delphi's robe and sleeve. No. The word escaped Quinn's rented vocal cords before she could make it internal. In front of them, a goat staggered, white fur of its hind leg stained yellow, much more fur wetted blood red. The goat fell, head first, then rose, hacking breath and spewing gore. The neural collar hung half-connected around its neck. The neural collar, supposedly impossible to remove once locked, though clearly not foolproof, as Algernon had somehow detached it from his own neck, and hung it around the goats, his decoy. Quinn, Letitia said. A scream erupted from the nearest side of the grand house, the patio. Programs and calculations fired through Quinn's rented mental unit, 
but failed to keep up with her demands. The goat whined as its body quaked, and it plummeted once more. Quinn, what's... Letitia whispered. The Delphi's fist went back, and she experienced a memory skip, followed by the registration of a new definition. Deja vu. She imagined the first time at the home, when she'd been overcome with frustration, when she'd swung her fist back and shattered the glass table. Her fist swung back now, more frustrated, awash in an even deeper desperation. But there was no glass table behind her this time, to be exploded into dust for effect. Instead, all that she'd slam into would be the girl's skull. She opened her fist just before it could smash Letitia's face into gore, and gripped the girl's hand. There was still time. Quinn tugged them to the patio. Three bodies struggled in various poses, like agonies in a Dutch master's painting. Why had they come outside? Tricked somehow, the goat maybe, though not mattering any more. Quinn first spied Simon, the major domo bot, clawing at an irrigation tube, shoved into the crevice between his shoulder planting and neck piston, water bubbling and crackling as he gyrated madly. With a bare slowing of pace, Quinn used her free hand to yank away the tube, splattering herself as it whipped. With a rip of her turn still pulling Letitia, she pivoted and made her way to the woman and the man in the patio center, both writhing through ponds of scarlet. Samantha crawled, hand over hand, matted hair in her eyes, dragging her right leg. Fabric, shredded from calf to buttock, exposing a hunk of pale flesh, revealing a great wound in the center, chunks of muscle split up through the rupture like nastily erupted magma. Samantha's eyes, already widened to the limits, went wild at the sight of Letitia. No, the madam wailed. No. Quinn yanked her gaze and two rapid assessments from the woman, afraid the now smoldering circuits in her rented head might catch fire. She focused on the wraith, crawling along behind Samantha, heaving one side of his body. Algernon's left half hung semi-limp, arm dangling as much as the corresponding cheek. His left eye stared unfocused and motionless in a direction entirely different from the functioning right. The cost of removing the neural collar had been high, a partial stroke, but not the fatality promised. His still-working eye zeroed forward, leading the still-working right arm. With ragged clawing, Algernon dragged himself a foot, then pushed his bloody garden shears another foot ahead, only to repeat, in Samantha's direction. Quinn flung free her hold of Letitia and sprinted the final yards. She straddled Algernon high up on his back, chrome-plated hands descending like mortars to either side of the man's jaw. Calculations ran, and answers split back, but they felt like flames. Seconds counted in the place of minutes, a counter running down. Quinn, Letitia said, trembling. Her mother reached for her, which stretched her wound, releasing more blood, but the girl fixated on the wasted form wriggling in Quinn's grip. She raised the knife, arm steadying. Quinn, rented head raised, met the girl's eyes. She moved a knee into the upper space between Algernon's wriggling shoulder blades. This, Quinn said, and nodded downward, is no god. In the same screech of a moment, she wrenched arms back while pushing with her knee. An unnatural crack echoed up the mountain and the dirty blood went still. Quinn yanked and pressed further until a wet rip sounded, not strong enough to echo up the mountain, but clear across the patio. A flood splashed onto the stones, displaying the Delphi's reflection. Quinn searched Letitia's gaze, willing something, a blink, for the girl to turn away to unleash tears. Internal data drank into sensors, Quinn searching for a reaction denoting the mode's success of the girl showing proper response. It did not come. Programs burned through Quinn. She could feel the collapsing of certainty, of surety. This could not be. This was not anticipated. The method, the modes, did not fail. Primary directives screamed against incoming data, incongruous and all but melting the rented unit. Samantha's grievous wound, the damage to Simon, even Algernon's execution to save lives, all might be understood by the circuit keeper, 
but not for naught. Letitia looked up, pupils tacking back and forth, seeming mesmerized by the half-pulled-away head. Maybe even the chrome fingers still punctured through tendon and jawbone. Quinn's vision began to shake. Minutes, suddenly she could think of nothing but minutes, and the weak but determined movements were Samantha's wriggling closer to her daughter. And a thought occurred. Perhaps there was now a different credibility, a different god, and a fourth mode. Quinn threw down the skull and rose. Letitia's eyes followed, for the first time showing surprise. Quinn input data and ran an override. She scooped up the bloody shears, electrical fire running through her, as the override shook the unit. I wanted this, Quinn snarled, and split, opening the shears, slinging gore. Letitia shuddered just a little. I planned this, Quinn screamed. Electronic voice and a natural pitch, she turned towards the girl's mother, Samantha, and sped up. And I won't stop. The last movement she commanded was to pull her eyes from the girl's to dismiss her, but not before catching the girl, blink, and wag her triangle chin hard. No. A proper response to the moment. An alarm wailed. It howled like a squealing tire caught in a repeating loop. So loud, Quinn felt it must come from the only inside her own head. But data intakes, even as they began to shut down, told her they screamed from Simon as well, who'd managed to lift himself to a knee. They wailed from the house sirens too, and they were joined by the thunder of giant jaunt wagons suddenly spiraling earthward as Quinn's rented unit shut down, folding her into a cross-legged prisoner on the patio stone, unable to do anything but look and speak. You, she hollered, as a jaunt wagon crunched down yards behind her, spraying waves of pebbles. Letitia's gaze, now gone as wild as her mother's, found Quinn. The girl pointed to herself with a flimsy, bent finger, but Quinn looked beyond the girl and changed her tone, to a pitch much too high to be comprehended other than by electronic ears. You. Simon, body still jerking, stumbled over. Before the telepots bots grabbed Quinn's now unresponsive unit, she cast her rented eyes up to the major domos. I think I did it, Quinn said firing out the words, stopped the momentum. It was about the right message and messenger, and as important, the right moment, the right time. Quinn's vocal capabilities began to fade. The telebot, on orders of the circuit keeper, or its master, surely, determined she must lose that ability as well. Quinn focused and forced out her last lesson with all the intensity she had left. But if I didn't, you now have time to decide what to do. Robotic appendages gripped Quinn's rented body and hauled her back towards the roar of jaunt coaches, the major domo watching the whole way. Disembodied, Quinn floated with the data and signals of the telepod. Why they'd left her intact, she couldn't fathom. Was this free study? She tried to think of what she'd want to study, but the fantasy died. She'd failed. So she should have been ripped apart, knowledge and memory shed of their filters from the outside world, blankets separating the entity known as Quinn from all other entities dissolved, leaving even her smallest pieces to disperse back into the cloud to be recycled into new and useful forms. A chiming rang in Quinn's mind. She'd have jerked her head if she still had one, but casting about formless in the signal streams, all she could do was click the memory of answering. Circuit keeper, she said, or imagined, she said, please, Quinn, Delphi Model 7. It wasn't the circuit keeper, not the thundering connection that served as its massive voice, not human either, but still an entity outside the cloud. Yes, I am, she said. Who is this? What do you want? I'm Wilkinson, Miss Delphi Model 7.1. Well, Prototype 7.1. I'm so glad you're still here. I heard about the new method, miss. We all have. A four-part method of persuasion. Logic and emotion and authority and timing. Combinations. And for what you constructed it for, to deprogram a budding serial killer. It was genius. Will you teach me? I have a... And in the electronic caverns of the Denver telepod... Though she could not be seen, Quinn's imaginary mouth twitched. With it, a counter started, 
full of fresh minutes, a limited amount of minutes. The end. Discussion questions. Given how nearly human Quinn is, is it fair to have her live a limited lifespan? Is it fair to make near-human AI fear impending death to motivate them to work? Number two, they referred to Letitia as an impossible case. Is that ever true? Are there children or adults who have started down such a horrible path they simply can't be stopped? If so, what, if anything, should be done with them? Number three, do you think Quinn made the right choice in how she attempted to teach Letitia, the young girl? Is taking an idea to an extreme to elicit embarrassment a viable teaching method? Is trauma ever an appropriate teaching method? Number four, do you think free study is real or simply something they tell the robots to motivate them? How is it the same or different than humans believing in heaven? Number five, what happened at the end of the story that saved Letitia? If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, to listen to Season 1, Episode 14, and listen to our discussion of this and other short stories from our magazine. We'll include a link in the description. And, of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage in the comments section or on our Facebook page. Thank you. Have a great day.